When did the U.S. men's soccer team last win a medal at the World Cup? <laughs> 1930, third place. The only medal ever won by the men's team, third place. But what about the women? We know the answer to that because 20 million of us watch them on TV. Four times, four times the women's team has won first place. Four times, four gold medals. Remember, girls, just dream big, work hard, and you'll be rewarded. Not exactly. Remember the soccer chant? Equal pay! Equal pay! Equal pay! Equal pay! Even the very best players in the world aren't paid fairly. I say, pay the women what they're worth. And oh yeah, that would be more than the men. <laughs> Let's talk about money. It's my favorite topic. How much do you make? What about you? How about 80 cents? On average, a woman is paid 80 cents in comparison to a man earning $1. 25%. That's my number. That's how much less I was paid when I started working on Wall Street, even with an MBA in finance from a top-ranked business school. What's your number? Perhaps you don't know, because you work at a company with a culture of pay secrecy, like I did. So how did I know I was paid less? I had a sample size of one. I dared to ask only one fellow banker how much he made. And when I found out how much more he was paid, even though we started working on the same day, in the same position, with the same education, I said, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> How'd you get that? He simply answered, I asked. As smart as I was, I didn't know to ask for more because I was just so grateful for the opportunity. I was grateful because I arrived on Wall Street with a different background than most, one that made me feel like an imposter. And when you doubt your value, you definitely don't ask for more. When I applied to business school, I only applied to one. I was a Hail Mary applicant with a really big ego. I was an English major and a French minor, and I hadn't had a math class in over a decade. I was an outlier from day one, surrounded by the future titans of industry. And I had no idea what career I wanted, so I simply tagged along with my friends as they pursued consulting. And I actually made it to round two, but I imploded in the first five minutes of the interview over a simple supply and demand question. Fast forward a few months, and I landed my dream job. Make rich people richer. I can do that. I had no problem asking entrepreneurs and CEOs for their business, but when I got paid, all I said was thank you. I didn't speak up. I didn't ask for more. Come on. I thank them for letting me still work there. My story is not unique. My details may be, but my outcome occurs across all demographics and all industries. 30%. When women negotiate, we ask for 30% less. 20%. 20% of us have never negotiated our pay. I'm raising my hand on that one. Remember, I was just lucky to be at the table. Don't get greedy, don't get demanding, and definitely don't get bitchy. <laughs> and I didn't for years. I was afraid to ask for more because what if they don't like me? What if they think I'm too assertive? What if they say no? Maybe this is you. Maybe this is your wife or your daughter 
or your sister. Maybe you'd like to stop nodding your head in agreement with what I'm saying. I know I would. We have a problem. We have a problem when women are paid less because women's rent doesn't cost less. And women's groceries don't cost less. And women's health care definitely doesn't cost less. Equal pay for equal work is not a new problem. When women campaigned for the right to vote, one of their platforms was equal pay. That was over 100 years ago. So where are we today? Today, there are four well-researched reasons why women are still paid less than men. And there's not much we can do about them. It's where you live. In Washington, you get 78 cents on the dollar. Idaho, 76 cents. It's your race. Black and female, 61 cents. Latina, 55 cents. And it's your age. Men's earnings top out in their late 50s, early 60s. Women's plateau by their early 40s. And it's your education. You might think the more educated you are, the smaller the wage gap would become. But there's an inverse relationship. Men with bachelor degrees, on average, are paid more than women with master degrees. But wait, you say. Women are paid less because we work less. We work in lower paying fields. Or perhaps some of you dare to say, women want it less. We don't negotiate. We don't lean in. Now I'm shaking my head. I'm a numbers person. Let's go back to the data. Two thirds, two thirds of women work in the four C's. Cooking, cleaning, caring, and clerical jobs. And yes, those jobs pay less. In fact, seven out of 10 minimum wage workers are female. When women become the majority worker in any industry, the overall pay comes down for both women and men. Nursing, childcare, education, so let's talk more about occupation segregation and off-ramping, two more causes of the wage gap. If only more women worked in STEM, if only more women stayed in the workforce, if you survey elementary age girls, three-fourths of them will say they want to work in the STEM fields. Teach your daughter to program a robot, and she's all set. But really, how many women actually work in STEM? I know many of them, and it's not enough. Something happens when women enter the workforce, and that something is called life. We have partners and progeny and pets and elderly parents. We also have cooking, cleaning, caring and clerical work to do when we get home from our day jobs and our night shifts. Women do the vast majority of unpaid work, and life doesn't just happen during after work hours. When I paused, I knew my earnings would decrease. On average, a one-year career pause lowers earnings power to 89% of full potential. A three-year pause, down to 63%. I paused for eight years, and I won't ever catch up. And unless I live in a city or state that has outlawed salary disclosure, my lower paycheck will follow me from job to job to job. In my first job, I earned $16,000. I worked full time. I wore suits to work. I sat at my own desk in a nice office with a sliver of a view. And for every job after that one, there was always the line to write down my previous salary. 
I learned to leave it blank, just like I don't disclose my full medical history. Why does my dermatologist need to know about my obstructed bowel? Why does a future employer need to know I was underpaid because of my geography, because I didn't negotiate, or because, more likely, of my company's biases? Don't make assumptions about my capabilities based upon my past paycheck. Pay for the position, not for my paycheck history. Equal pay for equal work is not just a low-wage earner issue. Let's look at women in the highest-paying jobs. To be in the top 2% in Washington, a woman needs to earn $170,000. But to be in the top 2% as a man, he needs to earn $440,000. So even when women like me jump through every hoop, even when we make bank, we are still terribly underpaid in comparison to our male counterparts. But despite the barriers, despite the biases we face, women succeed. We succeed at work, and we succeed when we lead. But we are decades away from succeeding at earning equal pay for that great work we do. Are you still nodding your head? Do you agree this isn't fair? How many more data points of inequality do we need? We nod our heads when we agree that something should be fixed. But that's the problem with head nodding. Nothing happens. Nothing happens if we just nod our heads. I want you to clap your hands. We clap our hands when something gets done. Don't just agree with me. Don't just nod your head with me. Take action. Imagine what could happen if everyone listening did just one thing. Here are some suggestions. Number one, are you a leader? Then lead. Conduct a pay audit. This is not one and done. It is not enough to uncover the problem. You need to commit a budget and policies to fix the problem every year. Pay audits lead to pay transparency. Pay transparency is critical for reaching equal pay. Number two, managers. Measure outcomes, not appearances. Mothers are the most time-efficient employees you'll ever hire. We make the most of every minute because, yes, we do have somewhere else to be. Provide flexible policies so that both women and men can perform well at work and well at home. Give men time and permission to share in that unpaid work being done at home. Number three, mentors. Thankfully, the Me Too movement changed the conversation on sexual harassment. But one backlash is that men are stepping away from mentoring women. Like men, women need face time with decision makers to be promoted. My best mentors have always been men. They taught me how to race fast cars and drink bourbon and make money. In a word, my mentors were fabulous. Men, it is time to step forward, not back. Four, parents, stop turning moguls into groomers. I moved to the Northwest because I love to ski. This is the time of year I start dreaming about powder days. Stop smoothing out the bumps of life. Let your daughters fail. Let them fall down and crash. Stop telling them they can be anything they want. And instead, teach them to speak up for what they need and what they deserve. Teach them it is okay 
to be told no, but it is not okay to be afraid to ask. And five, everyone, own this problem. Don't just nod your head. Use your voice to change your organization. Talk about pay disparity, no matter what level you're at. Don't perform on a stage or speak on a panel if women aren't represented. Don't sit in a meeting with all men. And ladies, stop being the note taker. Stop observing, start contributing. Don't just nod your head. Equal pay for equal work is not a women's problem. Equal pay for equal work is an economic issue. It is everybody's problem. Hiring, promoting, and paying women is good for women, but it's also good for families. 2.5 million children will be lifted out of poverty, and it's good for companies. Advancing one woman to the C-suite is correlated to a higher stock price. And it's good for America, to the tune of adding 500 billion to our economy. So yes, equal pay is good for everyone. I am often asked at the end of my talks, when will we know that we've crossed the threshold on equal pay? And here's how I answer. We will know that we have gone from head nodding to hand clapping when the women on Wall Street are simply called bankers, not women bankers. And when Forbes publishes its most innovative leader list, they will set aside their biases, they will fix their methodology, and that list of 100 names won't include 99 men. And we will know that we have crossed the threshold when I no longer get invited to speak on equal pay. <laughs> but at our current rate, that's projected to take 208 years. So no, women can't do this alone. We need to take action together. Equal pay for equal work won't happen until everybody stops nodding their head. From unity comes strength. From strength comes victory. With victory, we can finally start clapping our hands. Thank you.